And thank you everybody for coming. I am Kelly Whitmore, Alpha Oregon's program manager. And I'm gonna also welcome Lisa Watson, Alpha Oregon executive director in a moment. And I just wanna say welcome to a few people. Uh, Melissa Lampro, who's Alpha, our Alpha Oregon operations specialist. Um, some of these folks may or may not have arrived. I don't know yet, but I know Kendall Clawson is here. Thank you, Kendall, for joining us. She's the Alpha Oregon Executive Director who had the vision for this project. Kimberly Shang may be here. She is the Alpha Oregon Executive Director who supported me for my first year during this project. Also, our funders, uh, the Ford Family Foundation, Meyer Memorial Trust, and uh, Oregon Community Foundation, and we, I think we have Carly Brown here today. So thank you, Carly, it's good to see you. Um, so huge thanks to our funders. I also want to welcome all of our Alpha Oregon Senior Fellows and many other leaders who have uh, supported and participated in this project. And of course, all of the committee mom members who worked on these projects and they are the reason we're here today. So to recap, the Urban Rural Connection Project began with a series of regional dialogues taking place across Oregon. 13 senior fellows uh, or Alpha Oregon graduates, a number of who are here today. Good to see you, thank you for coming. These uh, senior fellows facilitated these regional dialogues. And at the end of the last dialogue, they were charged with selecting two to three issues that came up the most and most represented Oregon's urban rural divide for the next phase of the urban rural connection project. They deliberated for hours. And as you all know, they selected broadband access because the digital divide is so represents the urban rural divide or is part of the urban rural divide. Land use policies because communities experience these policies in such different ways and diversity, equity, and inclusion, because issues of discrimination and painful experiences had by individuals of color came up so frequently and consistently. This holds individuals back and communities back. From there, ALF Oregon identified these incredible three sets of incredible leaders who volunteered their time to dig into these issues further and fi find ways to amplify and advance them. What you see today is the product of hours and hours of their volunteer time developing projects of these issues. I hope you also will see the relationships and connections that these individuals developed. So I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa Watson for a moment to introduce herself and just say a big welcome. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I have to start with a huge thanks to um, reiterate all of those thanks, but huge thanks to Kendall and to Kimberly who passed the baton on to this team and primarily Kelly to lead this project forward. So thank you to my predecessors for teeing us up to um, close out so far what has been an amazing, amazing experience for us on staff and I think also for the participants. So. Thank you to both of you and welcome to all of you. It's really great to see so many faces, um, both ALF uh, connected people and others that are just interested in this work. So one of the things I wanted to share is it's been really fun um, hearing from Kelly um, in our check-ins about these projects and how the members of the committees have gotten to know each other and build connections, build relationships. Um, with senior fellows outside of their own class. Um, and that's one of the things as an organization that has been a, a primary focus for us is really cross class collaborations and connections. Um, Kelly shared with me uh, feedback that she'd gotten in an email from one of the committee members that I wanted to share with you. And this person said, I just wanna reiterate that what I said at the end of our, what I said at the end of our meeting, it was great to see everyone and to have virtual hugs. I would put getting to know you all right up there with Oregon scenery as a reason that living in Oregon is so wonderful. So um, just one reflection from some of the people who have been working on this project for quite some time and who are just really grateful for the connections that it has brought to their lives. Um, part of our mission is to join and strengthen leaders for the common good and for a better Oregon. And so it's so fulfilling to hear someone reflect back uh, when we do succeed in that effort. Thank you all for your commitment, 
and definitely for sticking with your fellow committee members through what has been a really crazy time, as Kelly alluded to. Nobody imagined having to finish this in the midst of a pandemic. So thank you. Um, and I hope you all feel pride and a sense of accomplishment in this work. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lisa. And now I have the great privilege to introduce Kendall. I invited her here because she had the vision for this project. She, ser she now serves as a president and CEO of Brett Makers of Oregon and Southwest Washington. Before that, she was our executive director. She's a proud member of ALF Oregon Class 28. She's also served uh, as the deputy chief of staff for former governor John Kitzhopper and also with current governor Kate Brown. She was responsible for leading all kinds of departments <laughs> there. She has accumulated more than 25 years of nonprofit leadership and public sector experience in her day jobs and probably at least that in her volunteer time serving on boards and committees. She brings her vision, commitment to inclusion and equity, her responsiveness, her sense of humor and ability to rally people and tackle big problems. So Kendall, I will pass it over to you. Um, to talk about how you came up with this vision and what you were looking for. Thank you very much, Kelly. And hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to say that I am trying to practice some discipline. I'll, those of you who know me know that I can be a little verbose. And so my, my, uh, my form of discipline is to actually write this down so I'm not all over the place. So um, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, and, and really honored to have this opportunity to kind of talk a little bit about the, the vision and how this whole thing started. Um, but I have to first acknowledge a couple of people, um, Juan Martinez and Mariana Lindsay, who were a part of my team uh, when this whole idea hatched. And it was really our work together that made all of this happen. And I have to give an extra special, special shout out to my very favorite Mariana in the entire world because she literally took a bunch of my sort of crazy thoughts and ideas and turned it into something tangible. So uh, I just wanna thank Mariana um, at the beginning of this. So, you know, when this whole thing came about, um, Oregon was facing a, a whole host of challenges that really impacted our ability to thrive. We we're looking at things like undersourced educational systems, um, limited housing options, diminished economies, all kinds of things that many of the things we're still seeing today. Um, but at the same time, what we were witnessing was that a lot of leaders in these communities um, were sort of separated and divided into these little factions opposing one another and that they would cite, oh, it's the urban rural divide that's keeping any of this stuff from moving or changing. But I knew that through my own ALF experience and then along with leading five other ALF, ALF classes, uh, through their journeys, that there's something off with that, that there was a challenge to this notion of this radical sense of difference that kept us from really understanding one another. And truthfully, it started with the fact that my buddy, Jake Gibbs, was from a rural community and was about as different from me as he could possibly be. He's a white, cisgendered, straight, rural Republican timber guy. And I thought the first day I met him, what on earth will I have to talk to this guy about? We are like from different planets, it makes no sense. But through our ALF experience, it turns out that we actually have a lot in common, um, that we dream about similar things, that we care about some of the same stuff for ourselves, for our families, our communities, and really in a lot of ways for the world. And the challenges that we were facing in our communities were also really similar as well. We were dealing with, with things like, how do we make change when our systems are so rooted in hierarchy and an unwillingness to work collaboratively? But it was when we started to look into the details that defined those barriers that brought this whole idea to life. So every time, we get into our cars and we travel to a new community during our, our ALF experience, we learned that many of these issues that were challenges that we shared, that regardless of what part of the state we occupied, we had this 
sense of commonality about the things that we cared about, that we hoped for, that we wished for ourselves. But we lived in that space though, where um, there was this sense that no one outside of our own communities could possibly understand what we were dealing with or how we were impacted by them. And that's created this illusion of this urban rural divide. Now I, I say illusion on purpose because we all know that ALF is a counterpoint to this notion because ALF has actually taught us to do the most important thing that we need to do to understand one another, and that's to talk to each other. It's, it, it's important that we're working across difference, that we're finding that connective tissue that helps us get past what separates us so that we can actually find what we have in common so that we can solve problems. So, um, you know, there was no better way than to use this incredible network of leaders who are responsible for problem solving across the entire state to help us figure this thing out. So as it originated, the problem aimed to have two, uh, the problem, the project <laughs> aimed to have two phases. Uh, the first uh, were the regional dialogues, which many of you uh, attended. And uh, they uh, took place around Oregon in six regions and brought experienced seasoned leaders together to have these really important conversations. Each dialogue asked uh, the regional participants to explore their own and other participants' realities by defining and describing the urban rural divide in their own words, and then by naming those, those big challenges that they were all facing in their own communities. So in dialogue with one another, we all know, right, that uh, we have an opportunity to share personal stories, um, our hopes for Oregon, and stories of successful tactics that we've implemented to address community issues. So why did we want to use this notion of dialogues um, in this effort? Uh, so one thing that we know is that data collecting projects are often premised on gathering quantitative data. So with that, we're trying to get the, the, the intent behind that really is that we're, that these efforts will offer some definitive conclusions. So, but when we started to research uh, the divides between communities, much of the data lies in the lived experience of people, which we all saw as we did our ELF classes, um, which is why the Urban Rural Connection Project intentionally relied on quantitative, qualitative data gathering through firsthand conversations with diverse leaders. But we also understood that focusing in on just individuals' experiences um, might make it seem as if the content uh, would lack some, in, uh, some empirical rigor. But really our intent was not to create some uh, bunch of exhaustive conclusions that, that caused, um, uh, you know, the, the, the caused or, or perpetuated the, the divides across geography, but rather to really create spaces where there was a high level of candor, where we spoke openly and freely, like we do. You build that relationship, you build that trust, you speak openly, and the truth comes out. Suddenly now we're able to see things where we are able to demystify this notion of the divide and share these ideas more broadly. So the dialogues took place in uh, 2018. And after the last one, um, the, uh, the facilitators of the dialogues identified three issues that they saw um, as perpetuating or exemplifying the urban rural divide. Um, so the first is lack of reliable broadband. The second is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, the third is addressing this um, sense that voices aren't heard. And this was, was probably really most noted uh, in Oregon's um, statewide land use policy. Um, and so th these three things is what gets us here today, why we're here having this conversation today. Um, ALF is launching an opportunity for senior fellows to work together on one of these important issues. And this is us modeling this idea by working across our own individual class divides. You see what I just did there? Our class divides uh, as a continuation of this important work. We all know how we do it. It's like class 28 is the best. But ultimately, ALF as a network is the best at this work. So this incredible work is what we're all about in ALF. And I honestly could not be prouder of how this little crazy 
seed of an idea was gently nurtured by the right people at the right time and then grown under the steady hand of Mariana and Lisa and Kelly and Melissa and Kimberly and Juan and a bunch of other really amazing senior fellow uh, participants to turn us to this moment that we've got today. So we've got something here and I have no doubt that it's going to be super amazing uh, once we all start to pull our sleeves up and really get after this thing. The urban rural divide is a myth. It's a myth. We can change this notion. So thank you for everybody for your participation in this. Thank you to the team for creating this, this amazing opportunity for us to myth bust all day. So thank you so much. I'm gonna pass it back to Kelly so that we can learn more about this amazing project. Thank you. Thank you, Kendall. That was amazing. It's good to hear from your own voice about the origination of this vision. So let's get to it. Um, and first, I have to say, I glossed right over Mariana Lindsay's name. So Mariana is here today. She's going to be helping facilitate one of the question and answer sessions. She's amazing. She did all the work with the regional dialogue. So huge, huge thank you, Mariana. Um, and I hate it when I leave somebody so incredible out. Uh, so I'm adding you right in now. Okay, let's get to the good stuff, uh, the projects. So we're trying to keep to a tight timeline. Um, so we're gonna ask folks to drop your questions in the chat and then um, we'll record them. And then when we, if, when we get to the Q and A, you'll have a chance to ask then, or we'll get back to everybody with all the questions and all the answers. Um, with that, um, I am going to tee us up with the broadband committee. We're going to go through a round of questions first, and then we'll do the project uh, presentation after the questions. And so the broadband committee, their team name is Broadband Equity, though their backstage name is Badass Broadband. And today we have Maria Chavez Haroldson. Kate Lasky and Cameron Camp speaking with the group today and um, with the group today and I believe it is Kate Lasky up to answer the question of going into this project what did your group want to get right about this project thank you Kelly and um, I just want to say it's great to see everyone I do wish we were in person maybe soon we will get to meet again in person so yes, I'm Kate Lasky and our badass broadband group, and we were badass because we had a badass sense of humor. It was Maria Chavez Haroldson, Cameron Camp, Brad Earl, myself, Mike MacArthur, Jim Renard, Sal Sam, and Ashtika Walikala. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I am open to a correction. And what we wanted to learn more about was how to communicate the challenges and needs around broadband um, or high-speed internet access in rural Oregon and provide some clear way to communicate with NGOs, um, funders, policymakers about those needs and the solutions. And while the pandemic has shown a light on the need for digital inclusion, I believe we are still struggling with effective communication to support project development in, in our rural communities. Um, especially as ARPA funds uh, begin to be distributed. So through our discussion and collaboration on the Badass Broadband Group, we discovered we had uh, more questions than answers and recognized that community leaders also have these questions about broadband access. And that is my intro and I'll pass it back to Kelly for our next group. Thanks, Kate. So the next team is diversity, equity, and inclusion. The speakers here today are Amy Carlson, Annie Valtiera Sanchez, and Tom Fuller. And I believe Amy's up for this question. Going into this project, what did you all want to get right about it? Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, we, you know, the, the committee of DEI is a it's a big category and there were um, a lot of ideas and when we were working on in our first gathering where all of us were together um, we went around and sort of tried to do some ranking of ideas 
and every idea in the DEI project area that when there were like 40 of them had support. There were no like, none of them got any sort of like, maybe not that really. <laughs> and so we had a big job of figuring out kind of where to focus our um, energy. And, um, and I, you know, what we talked about when we were prepping for this was that um, for, for ALF, like um, there were a few things that we appreciated that ALF sort of um, helped get right, which was um, really prioritizing DEI in the first place coming out of the listening sessions, given the importance of it and, and the need across the state and being flexible to um, extend the timeline, um, work closely with us. It, given the reality that DEI work uh, that broadly defined is not really short-term work, and this project had somewhat of a short-term time frame on it, and um, and also bringing together a racially and geographically diverse team to to do the work. So just naming those things first. But for our team, um, we we wanted to focus on where we thought we could have an impact. We decided to focus on all rural communities, given that there often are fewer DEI resources typically available for rural communities. Um, we didn't want to take a generalized approach, so we uh, decided and, and were intentional about taking a regionally specific approach based on local needs. Um, we didn't want to lead or create something new, and we were very clear that we wanted to listen and support existing um, or emerging efforts that um, could use a little infusion of kind of energy and, and resource and access to the ALF network, et cetera. Um, and so when we talked about that, we talked about it in terms of like, you know, bridging communities and, um, and really working on uh, listening and being in a support, an active support role. Um, and we also talked about really wanting to center relationship um, no matter what we were doing. And that's part of what ALF is about, but it's also, it also seemed, um, given that we were a new group of people coming together without necessarily a shared equity framework and a period of time to make connections and find ways to do support, like that, that relationships had to, had to be centered. So those are some things we brainstormed when we talked about what we wanted to get right. And we'll say more about who was on our project and, you know, uh, all those details when we get to that. Thanks, Amy. That was great. And the land use team, uh, John Oberst is here and as well as Rick Allen of Madras and Michael Mills of Parkdale. And John, I believe you're up. Or what did Thanks, you want to do? Thanks, Kelly. Um, I want to begin by noting that we, we really, really struggled to narrow down this project. Uh, we use policy and policy in Oregon is a complicated topic, both in its fact and the, and the actual statutes and their applications, but also the range of feelings that folks have about those statutes and their impact on our state and on our lives. regardless of where, where a beautiful state that you call home. And I never did prepared state statements, but I had to. <laughs> now, hopefully I sound clear. Thanks to everybody. I really appreciate you all, your preparation. Um, and I'm gonna turn to Annie now of the Avengers to talk about how did you land on the project that you did? 
Thank you, Kelly. Hi, everyone. Annie Valtierra Sanchez. And I just want to say we also have a cool name. The Eve is for equity. And then the Avengers, because we wanted to be like superheroes and just conquer the whole state and create some equity, amazing projects. And um, so we, how do we get, how do we land on the project? We, as Amy mentioned, we had like so many, I think 40 ideas. We started putting them in buckets of like how they were related to each other, education, um, uh, financial wealth, uh, capacity building. We had like so many different areas and then also addressing age, right? Like if there is uh, equity in schools, like K through 12, higher ed. Um, and it was just amazing that coming of ideas that we, like Amy said, we, it was so hard to not support either one. And in the end, we landed on, uh, we prioritized financial, creating financial wealth, um, financial wealth building and capacity building. And then again, narrow it down to capacity building um, with the intention, and I took my notes, so I know we're limited in time. Um, we focused on capacity building uh, with the intended impact being long-term that we recognize that building power and civic representation among marginalized communities was um, very important. And also influencing institutional and systems change among entities that hold that power. And so that's a huge thing undertaking for the Avengers, but we still wanted to tackle it. So we said, we need to break it down to a small, um, you know, short-term goal. And that came to like, how do we increase awareness and, and action to shift those tables that are making decisions? Um, organizations who have systems that, um, that need to look into their equitable and inclusive practices. So um, that's you know, one, one, one of the short-term goals. And we also had a, a timeline, right? And so we couldn't, take forever and conquer the whole state. But we said, this is something we can do within the time being. Um, so we narrowed down to selecting three rural regions as um, Amy mentioned, and then started reaching out, you know, thinking like, well, can we identify who are in those regions doing some of this work? Uh, we don't wanna recreate the wheel. We don't wanna, we wanna support any work that's already being done. Um, and what's the potential, what's the impact? And so we reached out to different organizations in those areas, um, exploring as you know, we said, relationship is key. So we wanna uh, build relationships, explore if we can partner or how we can support. So rather than coming and telling communities how to do things, it's like, how do we support you and, and what makes sense for you? So we ended up focusing on um, supporting work-led that was, um, work that was led by leaders of color and focusing on capacity building by listening, intentionally listening to what are the needs and their goals in their community and addressing the systems. For example, we couldn't just say, you know, like we're gonna address financial wealth building, but not address, and here's some money and not address the system, right? It's doing band-aid work. Um, and also we had to make some adjustments due to the pandemic. And since we are the Avengers, we knew that we could do it. And um, because we were so uh, uh, ambitious, we broke down our budget into the three areas and ended up, you know, this is how we're gonna do it and divide and conquer. So this is how we landed on capacity building in three regions in the state. And we will let you know more. Thank you. Thanks, Annie. All right, now I'm gonna pass it over to Cameron Camp and he's gonna talk about um, the broadband committee and how they landed on their project. Thanks, Cameron. Thanks, Kelly. And and just because I'm so disorganized, how, how long do I have? I know we're trying to keep you a tight schedule. About three minutes and Cameron, minutes. just for you, I made these gonna do it. We're gonna do it. So we're talking about uh, we're talking about broadband, and um, the funny thing with broadband is, as we all know, it affects our situation, our lives. Lots of closing the digital gap, closing all kinds of gaps, uh, but it's really kind of a little bit out there in the air. So what I did is stood up in the front of the group and I said, you know, um, the ADD was kicking in. I'm going, you know, I just held up my phone and I go, how does broadband get to your phone? I mean, isn't it kind of mysterious? Like we're trying to figure out how to close this dick gap. We don't quite know what the gap kind of really is. It's like magic elves or something. 
we hear that we uh, the fiber is good, fiber optics. You heard that. That's pretty good. People say 5G is pretty good. People say that too. But then, like, what you know is that is that the best thing we should be thinking about? Then they have fixed wireless. They have DSL, and people are like, well, I don't really know how to get fo go forward. And one of the thoughts was, is well, you know, if we don't understand in some low level. It's going to be really unclear for us how to talk to the folks that we need to be having conversations with and explain what it is we want. Well, not what we want, but what would help uh, close the gap. And so really, the, uh, the idea was, let's come up with something that was like everything you wanted to know about broadband, but we're afraid to ask. Um, part of that conversation was with uh, some legislators. Uh, and one in particular, we mentioned, I said, well, what do you think about when you think about broadband? And she said, we, we think about a blank piece of paper. So at the top, we say broadband. In the middle of the page, we say question mark. At the bottom, we say money. Okay, fair enough. So we wanted to put some guardrails around what broadband means, what kinds of things people should shoot, be shooting for, and also what are the relative costs? Um, not a lot of people know that it, well, some people know that it's tens of thousands of dollars a mile for fiber optics, for example. Well, gosh, that seems like a lot of money. So you may want that, but how do you pay that for, pay for that 50 bucks a month at a time? And so we, we just sort of use that as kind of, kind of the guardrails and, and uh, I'm not seeing the sign yet. So uh, you're gonna, am I, am I close? Am I there? 60 seconds please. Anyway, that was the idea and that kind of resonated a little bit. And then we had to explain that. Now my problem is, you know, somebody asked me what time it is, I tell them how to make a watch. I get really deep and geeky and stuff like that. So we had uh, very, very useful to have uh, folks who maybe weren't so technical, but certainly want to solve the issues because, you know, that's 99% of the people we're really going to be having this conversation with. Then how to back that into the technical mm, strength to, you know, make the argument hold up uh, in, in some way. So I, I think that's what we try to do. And I guess, uh, I guess, Kelly, you're going to tell us if you think it worked. Other people in the community are going to tell us if we think it worked. But we, we'd like to have something we can share widely so people can use the education make the best decisions and I am done. Kelly. Awesome, thank you. And so uh, Cameron, that was great timing, by the way. Um, next up, we have Rick from the land use team talking about how we landed on, uh, on your land use project. I'm from Madras, and so I'm one of the few fewer rural people on here. So I'm sitting out in my backyard, but it means you can't see me. But I'm just a, a ball guy here, so there's not much to see. Um, anyway, um, you know, the land use is we took on this land use thing, and most of the people on our committee, and I would say they pretty much all had some level of experience in land use, whether they were a, a staff, they might have been an elected official, a mayor, county commissioner. We had a couple, three former county commissioners, a uh, thousand friends of Oregon. So we had a, a pretty diverse group of people. Um, and the reason I think it attracted us to this topic was it's kind of that program that's loved to be hated um, or hated to be loved. And yet it really is what has made Oregon great and a, a beautiful place to live and do business and people want to move here. Yet it's always under kind of um, uh, the gun. Um, people want to repeal it. They want to change it, you, you know, and how do you address it from rural and urban? Um, and so we kind of, we decided not to take on just a project or a particular area because you, where do you start? Where do you stop that? And lots of groups have, have gotten into land use over the years and with our budget timelines, you know, how do you take on Oregon's land use system? And, and um, so we, we threw that around quite a bit. <clears throat> he says there are a lot of issues, lots of challenges, and everyone comes at it with their own perspective. And it's usually per fairly personal. Um, so what we did is um, we just, what we found is that uh, people all say they're not listened to. And it doesn't matter if basically ethnicity, higher income, lower income, small cities, big, big cities. When an issue comes up, they feel like they're not listened to. Um, in reality, they probably were listened to, but um, they might not have got what they wanted at the end result. And the end result for them is so personal. It's very hard to get them to look broader if someone's building a pig farm next door to you. you know, you're not really interested in any philosophy or why people 
like Oregon or why they moved here because of land use. Um, so then we decided, look, um, how about putting together a great video, bringing together people from rural to urban, agriculture, planning people, and this could become a tool for planning commissions, uh, Kiwanis clubs, you can take that out if you're giving a speech or a talk and share it and educate people on kind of how Oregon got its start in the land use system and why it is a great system, but it's complicated and people, so many people moved into Oregon, they don't know what Senate Bill 100 was, they don't know why we did this and why aren't we like Idaho or some other place. And so we thought this video, it's short five minutes with great people with diversity talking about the land use system we have today. Um, and so with that, I'll hand it back to you, Kelly. Thank you, Rick. All right, we're gonna uh, get to the presentations uh, in just one moment. I know we're uh, keeping you all in suspense. I'm just gonna let Michael Mills of the land use team talk for a second about uh, what they liked about that project. Uh, each team will answer that question and then we'll uh, show the projects. Michael. Yeah, thanks. I'll keep it really brief. Uh, what we really liked, I think, about it too is we, we did touch on, if I can borrow the phrase, urban, rural interdependence, that we're all one state and what is good for one part of the state is good for all of us. And ALF is an example of that. We're one of the the few uh, leadership forums in the United States that decided that we all need to work together as a state, not just a, a city or metro area. And um, we really um, wanted to show the perspectives from different uh, portions of the state and show perspectives of how input uh, can matter and uh, to encourage involvement and not get discouraged if you don't always get what you want in land use decision making. But um, as we touched on, how do you make your input uh, most effective? Uh, it's not effective to get involved when you see the bulldozer across the street from you. The decisions regarding regulations have already been made. So it's important to approach these land use areas uh, upstream. And in this um, presentation that we have, the video, we uh, engaged uh, rural planners, urban planners, uh, people that are working the land, people who live within urban areas, and um, got those perspectives. So I think that's helpful. One of the things we touched on too, particularly in rural areas, is uh, limited resources um, that the, the planners in these areas to, to help be effective in, in uh, encouraging participation need the resources to do that. We can't just go to a rural urban our rural community and say, uh, go apply for this grant. Sometimes it's as simple as we don't even have the resources to put into a planner applying for a grant. So we've shared those perspectives and I think uh, I welcome you to look at the video and, uh, and take it in. I'm really happy that we were able to put this together and thank the videographer, um, uh, Brady Holden as well for, for really having a pop out for us. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Maria, can you tell us what you like, what your group liked about this project? Kelly, I can, <laughs> and I will. Good afternoon, buenas tardes. Um, what we produced, what we co-created and co-developed, which was some of my favorite um, parts of this project, was that it was really everyone's input, uh, perspectives, talents, or lack of skill and talents and technology. I would fall under what Cameron described as folks who are not so technical. So I really was curious about the project because I just assumed I'd be in the equity uh, group because that's been most of my professional career. But when they said, Maria, we're gonna put you in the broadband group, I thought, well, that's what I know least about. So co-created um, a video, a short brief video that is highly informative, uh, entertaining, it's a visual tool um, that addresses an issue that affects so many of our families. As an education administrator, I had no clue that um, broadband would be even a greater, um, there'd be a greater need to address this issue during COVID and the gap, educational gaps for so many families. 
So um, it addresses a serious issue uh, and we address it with a fabulous sense of humor. Uh, we learn from our mistakes and errors and we learned um, about the throughout the different iterations. We used an equity, diversity and inclusion framework. When we saw the first run through, it was like, oh, not all are represented. How can we change that? I think it was three or four iterations. Um, and that it's a short and it's concise and it's informative and that whoever observes it, whether uh, we started for, I think, two minute, three minute, four minute, it's short and it's brief, but it captures a lot of information and it's visual and it's translated in Spanish, uh, translated in Espanol. And the, also what we learned that you not best practice to just take something in English and literally translate it in Spanish. There had to be meaning and a cadence and, and the fact that that took longer. Um, so I believe we learned a lot and we learned a lot about each other. And we learned about how serious we are about taking uh, an ELF project and carrying it to completion and producing something that's effective and powerful that I think will inform a lot of people as myself, as folks who are not so technical. So thank you to my team. Thanks, Maria. And Tom is going to go next of the Avengers group. And we're uh, running, we're starting to really run low on time. So Tom, as briefly as you can, uh, quickly say like what uh, the Avengers likes about your project and then we're gonna show the broadband video. Okay, I'll be as quick as I can. What we liked about the project is was building relationships with each other and finding some new ALF senior fellows because we actively recruited people. Before I go on, I'd like to give a shout out to Mariana for doing an extraordinary job of hurting some of the most unruly cats on the face of the earth. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, we also built a meaningful relationship between ALF and CLI. We learned about folks doing DEI work in the communities that we in visited. We invested in local community college programs that were getting started on DEI work. KCC had started, Eastern Oregon was trying to figure out how to start after adopting an equity commitment and this helped us overcome some, to some extent the barrier inherent in the program of short-term limited funding. And finally, any organization that we worked with was already committed to this work, if not leading it. Thanks, Tom. All right, so with no further ado, I'm gonna share my screen. We use broadband many times a day for work, school, or communicating with friends and family. However, some communities still don't have reliable internet access. It can be a big challenge for business, hospitals, schools, and regular households. But what is broadband really, and how can we make it better for these communities? Broadband, or a fast internet connection, is really just a digital signal that gets to your phone, computer, or other device quickly enough to power your digital life. Think of it like a road. Some roads are wide and smooth, but expensive. Others may be cheaper to build, but are small and bumpy. These digital roads move data across wires, fiber optic lines, or even wirelessly through the air. While this may seem like magic, it's not too complicated. Let me explain. The internet itself is a mesh of pools of data held in centers connected to each other through fiber optic lines. These data centers talk back and forth to each other trillions of times each second, kind of like cars and trucks on a super large highway. From the large pools, the data turns down smaller and smaller roads to reach you when you send an email, make a phone call, or watch a video. The small roads going to homes tend to have more congestion, so information seems slower, like a traffic jam. Digital signals can speed up by using fiber optic lines to connect your house or business to your Wi-Fi access points. While these high capacity fiber optic cables provide the biggest road out there today, 
they cost tens of thousands of dollars per mile in Oregon to build. Luckily, there are other ways for us to access the internet. Your phone gets broadband from wireless signals from cell towers that dot the landscape. These signals are slower than fiber optics, but they get faster as technology changes like 5G, which allows you to wirelessly stream videos while sitting on a park bench in the sun, for example. But as everyone else tries to do the same, the digital road gets congested. Also, the further you are from a cell tower, or if you happen to be behind a mountain, it's harder for the digital road to reach you. Another option is copper wire coming through the phone lines or cable TV connections. Phone lines were laid around most of the back country where getting an internet signal is hard or impossible. These phone lines are still humming along just fine. Some clever folks figured out how to get faster and faster signals down these wires and now they provide internet access. It's a huge stride for access to more remote people. Another possibility is to use cable television lines which can be even faster than phone line connections. Cell towers can also beam signals directly to houses and businesses. These can usually get farther into the backcountry than other signals and are often pretty fast. Satellite service is another option, though it's usually more expensive and has delays. But fiber optics provide the widest, smoothest road for digital information to travel. Some communities already have reliable, fast internet connections. They might use a mix of wireless, copper, and fiber optics, sometimes funded through government or telecommunications pools, or even funding it themselves. Do you have reliable access to the internet in your home or business? Check out these resources to learn about getting reliable internet access for your community. There it was, a worldwide premiere of the broadband video. Thank you all. All right, so now next up we have the, and um, hold your questions till the end. I know there's a lot probably to talk about and ask about, but you can drop questions in the chat. And um, next up we have the Avengers and who are gonna share their project and I, believe that um, Tom is up to talk about uh, one part of their project. Tom, I'll let you take it over. I'm going to talk briefly about our efforts in Ontario, Oregon. Uh, let me first of all name our committee members that worked on this. Carol Turner of Portland, Brian Tweet of Baker City, Karani Mitchell of Bend, myself, formerly of Portland. Now I live in rural Pacific City and love it. Our committee members and other members of the Avengers team reached out to groups working on immigrant, immigrant communities in Eastern Oregon. Conversations were slow, but happening through U Valkyrie and the Welcome Center. Any ideas that we had started to discuss became impossible due to the pandemic. The committee regrouped. I contacted Cheryl Cruzen and Al's senior fellow who is involved with the Treasure Valley Community College. The TVCC was beginning to plan for turning their equity statement into a plan for their campus. Cheryl asked if we could support their efforts. The committee engaged facilitator Francis Portillo, a consultant and diversity, equity, inclusion, facilitation, and moderation expert. Her goal was to advance the relationships and trust building on the committee of the TVC staff and support workers on this effort. The committee met three times, including a visioning conversation about what these committee members wanted to see on their campus. Survey replies produced responses that the conversations were beneficial and meaningful. Some of these replies include, I felt very comfortable speaking with the team and appreciated everyone's efforts. I appreciated the flow of the conversations. It felt like we had time and space to follow where the group led. And all the time Francis had us moving toward our goals, 
and it was very grace, gracefully orchestrated. I think the group came together with a positive and open mindset, which created a comfortable and trusting space for us to begin these difficult conversations. When you feel that mutual trust and respect does allow you to be open and honest, you know that you will not be judged for your remarks or feelings. We are very pleased with the effort and in particular with the outcome that was generated and the input we received. Thanks, Tom. So Annie will share the second of three projects that the Avengers took on for their project in Ontario and Annie. All right, so my, the project I'm gonna share is in Klamathol. So that's one of the regions. And as I mentioned, you know, things changed due to the pandemic. So we kind of took off our capes, but we didn't throw them away. <laughs> uh, so if for our um, committee started off with five people, um, Sean Early from Grants Pass, Tom Furler from Pacific City, so Tom is all over, and myself uh, from Central Point. We also had uh, two other members who um, had other things pop up and had to sort of like take a step back. Um, and they were Peter Lawson from Klamath Falls and then Alicia Nicholson from Roseburg. Um, so the, as I, as I mentioned, we, you know, um, identified the, the regions and connected with local communities to identify what were their um, ED and I needs. And what I was hearing from people were saying like, we don't have the knowledge uh, on ED and I, and we don't have a way to like, how do we um, in, um, create, you know, a practice within organizations. So our committee then decided that since that was popping up that we, um, we decided to support the access for rural folks to some training. Um, and um, so Healthy, which is a regional health equity coalition here in, in Southern Oregon, which I also direct, um, we were having an anti-racism training uh, for two and a half days. So it's an intensive training that we um, sought out, planned out, um, and so our committee decided that we were going to um, sponsor um, a group of people from Klamath Falls to attend this training um, and also to have a, sort of like a diverse um, participants, right? So it's not all education or nonprofits. And like I said, things changed to, to, due to the pandemic and the training got canceled. So nobody was flying, nobody was traveling. Um, and with that came the change of like, oh, well, what do we do now? So Klamath um, Community College had just started their ED&I process. Um, and so our team voted to support their um, initiative in, in the training. And so that what they did is, um, so we put the funding for them to, to support their, their um, already their process. And what they received was two facilitated ED&I dialogue um, sessions that were conducted via Zoom, uh, one in November and one uh, February of this year. And each session had approximately 10 representatives from the Klamath Community College or KCC. Um, the, the framing of those two of the sessions were mainly on self-awareness of cultural um, or taking like a cultural inventory, like self-awareness for each participant and also establishing basic building blocks for equity work. Um, they wanted to look at you know, moving forward, what how they were um, informed in the state requirements for doing equity within an institution, and also identifying what are their institutions' priorities when it comes to equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, and mainly also identifying um, as an institution that they wanted to come from a spirit of equitable service to students and community. So what came out of those trainings, uh, what was reported to us um, was that there was an increase in awareness um, of and in between colleagues, even across campus. Some of them had never had these conversations and acknowledging that they came from unique cultural backgrounds and also a realization that they were willing and committed to engage in difficult conversations through, you know, through this work. Um, they also, the other outcome was that they took an inventory of current programs that are um, geared for uh, underserved and underrepresented populations within the college. And the other outcome was that they um, started an initial assessment of where the institution is and where they're seeing opportunity for the next steps um, 
through more funding, hopefully coming their way. Um, there was no survey completed by the participants, uh, but they, they did some kind of a report out, like a weather report, so put it into weather terms. Um, there, there were several, you know, like um, snowy weather ahead, so, but optimistic for sun. Um, one that I picked out especially is foggy. And it says that kind of fog in Klamath Falls where there is fog on one side of town and then you drive to the other side and it's sunny. So I think it's discovering how um, equity or anti-racism work can seem foggy and messy and uncomfortable, but then there is like enlightenment. So I'm hoping that um, that continues and that's for Klamath Falls. And actually I wanna say that um, real quick that Peter Lawson who was part of our team and kind of stepped back. Um, he is our contact and he was part of this training as well. So it was a nice circle that he um, actually stayed plugged in. So thank you. Thanks, Annie. So I feel like uh, the Avengers did triple the work <laughs> um, because uh, Amy is gonna talk about the third uh, event that they held. Thank you. Um, I might be biased, but I'm most excited about this part of our <laughs> project. Not that it's because I worked on it, I'm sure. Um, and uh, our team, so we were we were focused on Woodburn, and our team included Anthony Belize out of Woodburn, who's part of the ALF network, um, and Dan Elfers um, from Portland and with Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon, and Tom Fuller again, um, and myself. And then we were in partnership with the Kapasas Leadership Institute, which has been referred to as CLI or CLI. Um, and the folks from CLI, Jaime Arredondo is the executive director, Elizabeth Heredia is the people's representatives coordinator, Monica Serra Ortiz, the program specialist, and Eduardo Angulo. Um, I don't actually know his role. I think he's a partner or consultant that, that um, spends a lot of time with them, but. Um, but they're all, they were all um, engaged and part of the team and we, we all worked really closely together. Um, and I guess I'll just say backing up a step that um, we really um, had identified as a whole group that representation matters a lot in dismantling inequities and that one strategy is for leaders already at sort of traditional tables of power, especially white leaders to um, actively work to open their networks to leaders of color and share power. And, um, and that was sort of the, the basis of um, how we were thinking about what we were looking to, to do. And so in, in Woodburn, of course, Anthony is uh, um, a key contact there. And, um, and I had had the opportunity to work with Capacitas Leadership Institute in another context. And so I was aware of some of their programming and I was like, you know, it seems like there's a lot of opportunity for a potential partnership between ALF and Capacitas Leadership because People's Representatives is, is a civic leadership and it's a civic leadership program and they're doing training of um, community members who are interested in, in stepping up to serve on boards and commissions or potentially run for local office or, or a broader office. And there may, be, there may be folks even on this call who've been part of People's Rep I'm not sure, but um, but you know it's it's basically uh, mostly focused in Marion and Polk counties, but um, but I think Capasas has the potential to provide broader services around the state. And I just kept thinking, like, I think there's something here, you know. And so uh, we started conversations um, with with Capasas, and they were open to exploring what a partnership might look like and we get sort of started the process of building a relationship and exploring what that might look like and in the end um, as part of their people's rep program they sometimes have different speakers and training topics and some of the folks in the program are really interested in sort of personal branding and how to talk about themselves and who they are with you know authenticity and um, in a way that was culturally true to them but also um, you know uh, would be a powerful way to, you know, just, just sort of navigating like traditional spaces where you introduce yourself in certain ways and also wanting to own um, their own story, you know. So we, uh, as, as Jaime said it, like ALF did what it does best and, you know, used its network and um, identified 
Cynthia Manuel, who is uh, the owner of Authentica Consulting, a Latina who um, does DEI consulting, but also a lot with mentoring and marketing. And um, if you're interested, she has a little TED talk on, uh, on mentoring and peer mentorship and kind of flipping the script on that. But in any case, um, yeah, so, so uh, she came and did a training session on personal branding and uh, we helped plan that and Alf, that you use part of our budget to cover that. And then the big thing we did was um, following that, we wanted to then kind of use that as a launch pad to then go into a networking event where we would bring the Alf network together with the CLI network. And the CLI network granted is smaller, it's not been going as long. Um, I think they've had several, four cohorts maybe, um, so they're newer in, in their program, but, but, you know, we just thought there's such a potential mutual benefit to both programs. So, um, we planned for, we got, a, we got money or, uh, funded or supported by EcoTrust to use their space to not have to pay for it. I don't know what that, if that was a grant or what that was, but, um, but anyway, we, we got that and we were going to plan an, an in-person event and then pandemic happened. And so, um, we ended up pivoting to doing it as a virtual event. And the upside of that was people from all over the state could participate. And a lot of folks on this um, call today also participated. And, um, and you know, we, we ended up having, I think about 50 people participate and it was about half and half and lots of connections were made. Some follow-up happened afterward, lots of interest in connect, you know, do participating again if possible. And, um, and I, I will just share like two quotes from the survey. Um, I was blown away by the participants and how they engage, how engaged they were in the breakouts. I also felt the guiding questions were well thought through um, and uh, what people would like to gain at a future gathering, um, like uh, recommendations from people with more, more experience, um, intentionally exchanging content contact info and having a better understanding of all the different advocacy networks within the Latinx community, et cetera. So there's just lots of potential ideas and we're working on scheduling a next event that will actually be in person, we hope and plan in October and hope that you all might wanna join that. But I think the closing thing I would just say is that um, we're kind of asking ourselves going forward, you know, this was essentially kind of a pilot of what might be possible if the ALF and CLI networks um, continue to partner and come together and leverage each other's connections for the betterment of Oregon. And we're asking ourselves, uh, what seeds did we plant? What's growing? And what do we want to harvest? So that's it. Thank you. All right, so thank you, thank you. So next up we have the land use team grass is always with a team named grass is always or, greener or the Oregonians are generally proud of the land use we're the first state in the united states to do land use planning on a statewide level and one thing we acknowledge in this process that land use laws in oregon and throughout the united states were also used to divide people by race deny generational wealth and that's not always part of the discussion but it comes out in this video thanks Thanks, Michael. I'm glad. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Here we go again. This is the work uh, produced by the team Grass is Always Greener. You and I should claim we love Oregon more than anyone else, but that we love Oregon as much as anyone. Our thoughts today and our deliberations to come must spring from our determination to keep Oregon lovable and to make it even more livable. The original Senate Bill 100 was in the early 70s, and the idea behind it was to try to arrest what was then called urban sprawl. People saw a lot of growth in Oregon and did not want to lose those very special places and the basis of a lot of the rural economies and forestry and agriculture. You want residential lands, um, you want commercial lands and industrial lands so you can live and work and play in the same area. It's a challenge is that balance between non-farm uses, providing urban growth space for both commercial and industrial and housing needs inside the cities. That's the fight that the land use system has. The origins of land use historically were really around 
excluding certain people and predominantly excluding people by race. We don't tend not to think of it that way today. We tend to think of it as this way to organize our communities. We have a lot of people who don't understand the original reason for Oregon's land use laws. We have a lot of people who are staunch defenders of Oregon's land use laws, and that creates a room full of angst. It's tough to get farmers to put their shovel down and get involved in the political process. Citizen participation is really hard to get. Agriculture needs to get our story out. The land use system locks out this whole part of our community who was denied that opportunity to build generational wealth, the opportunity for home ownership, which is what we think of as the American dream in every community across this country. If we have a system that is built on those inequities, we ought to consider whether or not it continues to perpetuate those inequities. There are also some of the issues that may have not been foreseen when the laws were initially developed. And actually, by the latest numbers that we did, about 75% of our land supply is outside of our city limits uh, and not able to, to urbanize. And so we're starting to see a crunch on what can be developed. The challenges for these small counties, small cities, is the ability to have staff to implement the program. Many of the small cities have a part-time or maybe a full-time city administrator that doesn't probably have the expertise or the time, just the, the time to be able to spend a work through some of those problems. What I would like to see new in land use planning and how it can change over time. It's important that we have citizen participation at the county planning level. We're really fortunate when we have young farmers who are willing to go out and serve and be on the planning commission or testify in Salem to how what happens to the rules and regulations that affect their farm. The advice I have for people who feel like they're not being heard is learn how to listen. Get involved. If you become a little bit more well-rounded in your community, and it can help you understand the trials and tribulations that, for example, the government workers are going through in your community. I would encourage people to volunteer for your city or county planning commission, get involved with the program. You can talk with your local legislators, talk with your local elected officials, and um, work on improving the policy. We definitely have a concern about whether or not all voices are being heard. I think it's through a lot of trust building that folks learn their voice can be heard and does make a difference. I think there is some translation that needs to happen and some skilling up that needs to happen and bring those folks along that feel like they've been excluded from both the land and the processes for so long. So folks who are trying to be heard or who don't even know that they should be heard, keep raising your voice and keep in the processes and demand that we be heard. Oregon is an inspiration. Whether you come to it or are born to it, you become entranced by our state's beauty, the opportunity she affords, and the independent spirit of her citizens. All right, thank you. Thank you all, huge thanks to all of the committees. Say this is um, one piece of the kind of reveal or release of the Urban Rural Connection Project. Uh, you heard reference to the regional dialogues and those summaries will be released via a website soon. So uh, you will, when those are released, we'll be do having more conversations. And so you may have another chance to discuss broadband, diversity, equity, and inclusion, or land use policies uh, again. And so with that, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I wanna thank our board members who are here, Jake Gibbs, Stephanie Hooper, and Vicki Nakashima. Uh, thank you again um, also, oh, there's Kimberly still. Hi, Kimberly. <laughs> Kimberly and Lisa and our staff for help keeping me organized and all the committee members, you all are just uh, so fabulous and you made it to the finish line. Uh, thank you so much and definitely reach out with questions and if you want contact information. 
I have to jump in and just say, can we all please give a big high five to Kelly Whitmore for this work and leading it across this finish line. Thank you, Kelly. Oh, good job, Great Kathy. job. Great job corralling these incredibly busy and smart people. Thank you. All right, everyone. Have great days. Thank you for your work. We'll be in touch.